All right, well, we are about to um, uh, do the summer packet in five sections for you. This, uh, this part will be sections one through eight, uh, problems one through eight. And, uh, and over the course of the videos that you're going to be watching, you're going to get an introduction to some of the Algebra II teachers here at Richard Montgomery High School. In this video in particular, you'll be hearing from me, Mr. Chase, and from Ms. Engelman, and from Ms. Getz. So let's, uh, without further ado, uh, do, let's, let's begin. Taking a look at the first problem, we've got Gino, who's very confused about literal equations. Gino, as a boy, I guess, right? wants to solve that equation, f equals 9 fifths c plus 32 for c. Something useful that maybe he, he wants to do. He wants to transform a formula that takes c values and gives f values, and he wants a new formula that takes f values and produces c values. Uh, if you know how to solve the equation 68, equals 9 fifths c plus 32. Uh, if you know the order in which you would solve that equation, then you know how to do this one too. I think everyone would agree that you'd start by subtracting 32 and then maybe multiply by 5 ninths. So that's what we're going to do here. But instead of having like a 68 there, uh, we're going to have we're going to have a, an f. Excuse me. Just like you might do over here. And you subtract 32 on both sides. We're going to do that over here. And then we're going to multiply both sides by 5 ninths. Just like you would have done over here. Over here, actually it's easier when you don't have a number over here because you don't actually have to do any of the arithmetic. We're, we're done. Now let's see, now, now that being said, let's look at what the answers and see if this appears here. Doesn't look like it appears here anywhere. Hmm. Well maybe it's an equivalent form then to something that we have up there. Let's, let's maybe multiply this out and see because none of these are in this factored form. Let's multiply it out and see what we get. I get 5 ninths f minus 32 times 5 ninths. Maybe we have to think about what that is off to the side. What is 32 times 5 ninths? Is that 160? Well, actually, we could half the problem. It looks like it better be 160 <laughs> over 9. Yeah, all right, so I think that's right. 160 over 9. And then maybe it takes a little bit of work to convince you that that can be written in that way. Is that one that appears up there? 5f minus 160 over 9. There you go. All right. Now to Miss Engelman. You want to do the second one? Okay, so problem number two tells us to let A and B represent two numbers where A is greater than B. And then we want to state whether or not following statements are true or false, and we want to justify our answer. So notice with the first statement, uh, we're adding 8 to both sides of an inequality, and by the uh, addition property of inequality, uh, we can do that and still maintain uh, the original state. In other words, uh, the number on the left will be greater than the number on the right. So let me get a pen so that I can write this for you. So this will be true. And the justification is the addition property of inequalities. Okay, likewise, in the second statement, we're subtracting the same number from both sides. And in doing so, the subtraction property of inequality states that um, this, the left side will remain greater than the right side. It doesn't change that. So that is also true. Subtraction. So we see with inequalities, addition and subtraction really don't cause us any problems. We don't have to focus on the inequality sign 
everything stays the same. But that is not true for the next two statements where we have multiplication and division. We would still be fine if we were multiplying and or dividing by positive numbers, but because the numbers are negative, by the multiplication property of inequalities, when you multiply by a negative number, you need to reverse the inequality. So this would be false. By multiplying by this negative number, the left side is now smaller than the right side. For the last statement, notice we're dividing by a negative number, but the inequality sign has been flipped. So this statement is actually true. A started out larger than B, but by dividing it by a negative number, that expression is actually now smaller than the one on the right. So this is true. And it's the division property of B. All right, problem number three is some more inequalities, but this time it is giving me a solution to the inequality up here. So this number line is a graphical representation of a solution to either A, B, or C. So my thinking process when I'm doing a multiple choice problem is slightly different than I've just asked to do a problem. So for example, when I look at this solution and I see that over here I have an open circle if this since this is an open circle I can immediately eliminate choice C and I hope you see why the greater than or equal sign would mean what that when I was to graph the solution this circle would have to be filled in so this whatever this says I'm not even worried about what the math of this is saying I know that just because of the inequality, this equation, or I'm sorry, inequality, is not represented by this graphical solution. But when I scan and look at choice B and choice C, both of these do not have an equal sign under the inequality. Therefore, both of them are candidates for this solution. So, but that has reduced the amount of work I need to do. So I will go ahead and solve both of these using one of Ms. Engelman's properties from the previous problem. I have an inequality. I am dividing both sides by a negative value. Therefore, I must switch the inequality sign. And I've just made a mistake, haven't I? Negative 3 divided by negative 3 is indeed positive 1. I did remember to switch the inequality, but what happened here? Six over negative 3 is not positive 2, it's negative 2. So I'm feeling pretty good about the fact that I'm going to eliminate this choice as well because I see that this is an open circle but that I'm at a positive 2. I'm going to the left and to me left correlates to less than when I'm on a problem like this. So I'm pretty sure that my answer is going to be B. And if I was on a test and in a hurry, I wouldn't check this until I was, had more time later to go over the problem. But since we have some time and this is a summer packet, I'm going to go ahead and again use the properties from problem number two where I'm going to add nine to both sides and get negative four X is greater than negative 17 plus nine is usually negative what, eight? Notice that I added, and even if I had subtracted from both sides, the inequality sign stays the same, but here I'm going to divide by a negative, and I'm going to get x, and I am going to get positive 2 over here, and look what happens if I had forgotten to change the sign. That would confuse me. I'd be like, hey, wait a second. This says x is greater than, x is greater than 2, and I don't see that up there, so I might be confused. But hopefully, I would then say, oh, what you did was you forgot that when you divide an inequality by a negative, 
you need to switch the inequality. And then I'm happy and I say x is less than, open circle, positive 2, left open circle, positive 2, and that's right here. So I felt very good about my answer B. <coughs> You okay there, Mr. Chase? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at uh, number four. I'm going to do part A, and uh, let's remember the following property. If you were to see three to the A equals three to the B, the thing that we should say, and this is called the one-to-one -one property, but you don't have to necessarily know that, it should just make intuitive sense. If I said that I have 3 raised to some power, and that equals 3 raised to some other power, then it must be true that those powers are the same. And this is biconditional. This works in both ways. This is if and only if. So this is like the governing principle that's going to solve every one of these problems that we're about to look at. Uh, if that's the case, then we've got A and B here. It must be, it must be the case that x plus 2 equals 7. And now we can give this to like your little brother in pre-algebra. There it is. Subtract two on both sides and you got your answer. You want to take the next one, the single one? Absolutely. Okay, so let's compare B to A before we get started. And we can see that in A, Mr. Chase had an equation where uh, both of his exponents had like bases, whereas in problem B, uh, they don't, or they appear that they don't. But actually, uh, we can take the number 25 and we can rewrite it as 5 squared. And if we do that and distribute that square into the current exponent, and I'll do that in two steps so that you're not confused by what I'm doing, you will find that we are going to have like bases. So I have 5 squared, and the rules of exponents say that when I take a power to a power, I multiply. So I'm going to multiply x plus 1 times 2. And that's going to give me 2x plus 2 for that exponent. And now you can see that I have a problem just like what Mr. Chase just solved. Uh, my like base is 5, so I can set my exponents equal to each other and solve. And doing that, I'm going to move my x's to the left and my constants to the right, so that's going to give me x equal to uh, negative 5. And that's my answer. This gets? All right, so we're going to do the same situation here. Notice that um, un just like Ms. Engelman, my bases do not appear to be the same right now. So they started off with a problem where your bases were the same to show you the property. And then Ms. Engelman showed you how, oh, that's not going to stop me from doing this problem. I can rewrite into the same base. Notice that she had to take 5 and turn it into 25 into 5 squared. For me, I have a 9 and a 27. So that elementary school math was important where I start realizing and being able to recognize very quickly that 9 squared certainly is not 27. So it's not going to be the same situation where I need a square. Well, what can I do? What other base is common to both 9 and 27? Number sense, I hope, makes me realize that I can rewrite 9 as 3 squared. And I'm going to, just like Ms. Engelman, put that in parentheses so that I don't forget that the 9 was raised to the x plus 2 power. And I still have 9. This is still 9. This is still equal to 27. I am just going to rewrite 27. Conveniently, no one told me it wasn't for a test like it was in elementary school where I may have been tested on rewriting 27. Now I just need to do it. I need to rewrite 27. And I can rewrite it as a lot of different ways, but I choose right now to write it as 3 cubed. Right? We do, right? Common error, 3 cubed is 9. No, 3 cubed is 27, right? So I'm still not at Mr. Chase's place where I can ignore these threes, right? I can't ignore it yet. I don't have everything. I don't have just the same base. I need to do what Ms. Engelman did, which is distribute this 2 to everybody so that I now have 3. And I'm just going to put it in parentheses again to highlight what I'm doing. I'm using, again, a property from pre-algebra, right? A to the um, Bx, right? is the same as a to the bx. Sorry, I kind of wrote over that. So I'm just multiplying exponents. See the base one time, two exponents, write the base once, multiply your exponents. That's what I'm doing here. I just had to use the distributive property. So I have 3 to the 2, whoops, sorry, 2x plus 4 is equal to, again, see the base 3 once, 
see two exponents, write the base once, and multiply your exponents. And again, I'll just put the base in parentheses just for emphasis sake, so that hopefully now you can see base three, base three, it's as if they don't matter to me anymore, I'm going to ignore them completely, and just say, well, therefore the exponents must be the same. And now I'm down to algebra one. I did, I'm gonna collect my x's on this side simply for the convenience of then having a positive x. And there's my answer. And of course, with any of us, we could, any of these answers, we could take this four back here and say nine to the sixth must be equal to 27 to the fourth. Right, just replacing this x with a four and replacing this x with a four. I don't know what nine to the sixth is, and I don't know what 27 to the fourth is, but my handy dandy calculator should tell me that those two things would be the same. All right, Mr. Chase? Right. You guys are wonderful teachers. <laughs> Ms. Engelman and Ms. Ms. Getz. Let's see if we can use same, the same, some, same principles to help Vlad out. Um, he's working on trying to solve this equation using maybe some of the same techniques we had on the previous slide. So uh, the first thing that might occur to you is that um, maybe that uh, we can write this as powers of two. And if it didn't occur to you, then maybe looking at the sample answer choices uh, might suggest it. So let's take that cue. Um, let's think, okay, these are both um, maybe powers of two. Again, number sense possibly, or just trial and error would lead you to believe that two to the sixth is 64. Maybe you should just learn all your powers of two. They come up lots. Good suggestion, Mr. Case. <laughs> <laughs> 16 is two to the fourth. And uh, so this looks a lot like this answer here. Once we multiply exponents, we get, in fact, so I think this is gonna be, we could keep solving it, but all that's asked is, is this a good first step? And I think, I think yeah, I think A is a good first step. It says, the question asks, which of the following is not a correct first step? So we won't circle that one. That's, not, that's, that's a good first step, but it's not the answer to this question. Uh, the next thing that might occur to us is four to various powers. And now, this should be kind of remarkable to you that we can write 64 and 16, both as powers of two and maybe as powers of four. Well, let's see, let's see if that's even true. Uh, 64 is four to the third, I, I like that. So we could re-express the original problem in that way. And of course, 16, no, that's probably the one you're most familiar with, that's four squared. And so I think this second answer B looks pretty good to me too. If we multiply exponents here, we do have what they have in part B. That looks good, we could keep going, but I think part B is a good first step. Now, my question is, what about C? This seems, this seems pretty good too. Can we write both of these as a power of 16? It looks like the person who did C was thinking that, okay, well 16 to the fourth is 64, and 16, all right, now they're both powers of 16. Of course, what is the mistake this person is making? C is actually not the first correct, the first step, a good first step to this problem, because is, friends, is 64 the same thing as 16 to the fourth? No, I think that's a common mistake, because it is true that 16 times four yes. is 64. Times true, true, but 16 to the fourth power, just remember what that means. Is that 64? I don't there. think so, Mr. Chief. No, not, not even a little bit. All right. So C is the correct answer, moving <laughs> smartly along to number six. Okay, so here we are. We want to know which of the following three statements or expressions is the same as five to the two x. So looking at the first one, uh, the question is, can I get the number 25 in terms of base five? And I can because 25 is 5 squared. So 5 squared to the x is 5 to the 2x, which is what I'm looking for. But the question, I guess, would be is why does b not work and why does c not work? And what is the mistake? Here, um, again, with the multiplication as opposed to the repeated multiplication, 10 is 2 times 5, but it has nothing to do with an exponent. And over here, the person who did this, or would have selected this as an answer, is switching this around and making um, the base two, but we realize that base five cannot be written as base two because they're both prime. So the answer is A. All right, so we're moving on. We're gonna change topics a little bit. We did a couple problems in a row that had to do with exponents, rewriting uh, exponents in similar bases and solving for exponents um, and or variables up in exponential land. 
This is a complete uh, change right now, so to a different context, where I am just given a graph and I'm asked to read it and then answer questions based upon what I read from the graph, just like you would read a text in social studies, read a lab report in science, read a short story in English, and then be asked to interpret what you've read. So my first, before I even scan these problems and see what these are asking me for, I myself look at the story. And I say, the story is talking about time and the units are hours, and that is on the horizontal or the independent axes. So they are comparing time to degrees Fahrenheit. Degrees Fahrenheit is on the vertical or dependent axis. So I note that in my hours starts with zero hours and the time when this person or story starts and then incrementally all the way up to seven going by ones. But degrees Fahrenheit can be negative, can be positive. So I noticed that at time zero whenever the story started the degrees was negative, then went to zero degrees, brr, then, this must be a very cold place, eh? Ah, temperature in a freezer. Oh good, I thought it was temperature where I was living. That would be a bad choice. So I am going, then the temperature rises, rises again, and reaches a top. And I say to myself in math, a top is called a maximum. I don't know if they're gonna ask me about a maximum, but that's what I'm thinking as I read the story. Then the temperature, as time keeps going on, temperature is coming down and is back to zero. Zero degrees Fahrenheit, freezing. Then below, freezing, right? Below, negative temperature. So coming down all the way to the lowest point for the minimum temperature in this story. And then the end of the story ends when the temperature, when seven hours has passed and the story has ended and the degrees is still negative, but negative two degrees. So now I'm going to look at the questions and say, what are they asking me? When they say domain, I think independent, and they want to know what is the length of the story. The story started at time equals zero and ended at time equals seven. There's a variety of ways to write that. Some notation I could use would be square or hard bracket to indicate that zero is used, closed circle, all the way to Z seven, hard bracket or closed bracket, square bracket, however you want to call that because there is a closed circle there. I could also write it in inequality notation where the time that we're using is in between and including zero and seven. And usually any assessment of this type where you're filling in answers, their um, uh, a test assessor is going to accept any of these answers because they didn't indicate to me what version I need, needed to write it in. However, if this was a multiple choice problem, one of these would be on there and I'd have to recognize that they're all saying the same thing. So hopefully you know that domain, if they're gonna ask me about domain, you're not gonna be shocked that they're also gonna ask you about range or vertical. I guess I should write horizontal above independent and vertical above dependent. So what is the range of the story? So not the hours that this story took place, but the degrees. And since I read independent left to right, I read, just by tradition, range, bottom to top. So what is the bottommost number? Well, the bottommost number of the graph is negative four, um, you know, of, this, of the picture. But the bottommost value that is used is where I wrote my minimum. Isn't that convenient? And then where I wrote my top, my maximum. So I really have already answered that question. What is the range? I am going from negative three all the way through three. And if I'm using interval notation, I'm gonna put again hard brackets on those. I put soft parentheses if those circles were open. Um, or I could again write that degrees Fahrenheit goes between and including negative three and three. And again, I could have just written it out, you know, that degrees Fahrenheit is equal to negative three all the way through degrees Fahrenheit is equal to three. That's probably the less mathematical and less popular one, but I bet a nice test grader would accept that. What is the meaning of the f-intercept? Well, the definition of an f-intercept is when the other thing is zero. 
So if they're giving me F, the other thing that we're talking about is time. So I say to myself, self, when is time equal to zero? So time is horizontal, independent. When is time zero? Here's where time is zero. What is the F Fahrenheit value that goes with that? Negative two. So I say when time is zero, degrees Fahrenheit is negative two degrees. And I might want to, what is the meaning? That's usually a prompt to say, show off a little bit of writing. So I would actually say when time is zero, the freezer is at negative two degrees Fahrenheit, or I could say two degrees below zero. Lots of different ways I could communicate that I understand what the F intercept, and that's what these problems are. Do you understand what you are reading in this whole picture? At what time? So the first thing I'm gonna do is write T equals. They're asking me for time, give them time. Then I say minimum, minimum temperature. So temperature is vertical, minimum, I have it marked, and that is at negative three. So, but the mistake would be to write negative three. They didn't ask me for negative three. They said, at what time are you negative three? So what time is that? Looks to me to be six units, hours. And it's hours after this story started. On what interval of time so I'm going to put time in between something. At what interval? On what interval of time is the temperature decreasing? Decreasing is something I watch the function as I read left to right, go up or down. So increasing here. Decreasing. Decreasing. Increasing. So. I see, and here's the mistake that students often make with this, they will answer decreasing from three to negative three. But that's why here I wrote down on what interval of time and I right away wrote my T. Try to remind myself, they're looking for the T values over which that happens. So I say, here's my maximum and I go down to the T when that happened. Here's the minimum and I go up to the T when that happened. So what interval of time was the function decreasing? And that would be between three and six. And some of you might say, well, should I use these, in equal, should I say equal to or not? In reality, there's, they are not gonna take points off if you either include or not include because algebra one and higher level mathematics have sometimes will differ with their definitions, so you are safe. I'm going to include them, but you are safe. No one is gonna take points off for you. I don't think people hear me. They should not take off points if you also wrote your answer this way. Okay. There are some times when they're gonna be very strict about whether you have this inequality there, but turning points is not one of them. And of course, I could also write this in interval notation. Either one of those would get full credit. Or you could write it out in English, for God's sakes. We are just w wanting to see if you can read it. You could write out in paragraph form. Well, this function is going down from here. To, I mean, you could write it all out. And your test writer, your test grader, would be so happy that you understand what this is asking you that they will read everything that you write. Just be careful not to run out of time in a test. Don't write a novel. Um, all right, lastly, what does the statement, this is a statement because there's an equal sign here. So this is giving me a statement, and all I have to do is translate, just like I do in Spanish class, or French class, or German class. When they say adios, what does that mean? Well, here in math class, I'm saying f of five is negative two. So what does that translate that for me in the context of this given story or situation? So this is asking two things. Do you understand what function notation is? The function that gives me Fahrenheit so the function gives me Fahrenheit. This number is your x or your t or your independent. And this number is your dependent. So what is my independent again? Independent is time. So when time is five, right, when time is five, the degrees, the dependent is negative two. Well, let's see, is, is, is that true? Well, when time is five, 
what is, oh, sure enough, is negative 2. So they're not lying to me, these people. They're saying that, so all I have to do is translate that. At 5 hours, independent, 5 hours, what is the degrees? The freezer is at negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit, or again, you could write 2 degrees below 0, however you like that. You will note, as we go through these, which one of us has the best writing? And I will just tell you that I am not in the running. <laughs> I, do, I do not have nice writing. Yeah, that's a beautiful see. slide. <laughs> it is a little yes. bit, little bit chaotic, but like that's all right. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, well, that's a perfect segue to problem eight because we're thinking about functions already here. And I think that maybe the most intuitive place to think about them first is in the context of the real world. Um, it would make sense in the freezer to, uh, if you were looking at the thermometer, it wouldn't really make sense for at a given time for there to be two temperature values at that time. Um, so you can see that in this picture that's true. For every single time that you would give me, I would always give you back only one temperature. Uh, so that we can, we can formalize that notion as, as we talk about functions. And already we're thinking about functions because you were just using on the last part of that last problem, function notation even. Uh, and that's the definition of a function. Let's recall, I think everyone should have learned this in algebra, in algebra one. A function is a relationship between two sets where for every element of the first set, we call it the domain, there is assigned to it only one element of the range. Visually, that's really, really pretty easy to see, just like on the last graph. For every x value, we could say, for every input or every independent, we have all these names for the same thing. Maybe we should write these things set down. X, Input, we say sometimes. Uh, you could think about it like Musquette just said, it's on the horizontal. Horizontal. Uh, it's the independent variable. Independent. And we associate the value, the set of all values of x, or all the independent variables, as the domain of the relationship. And then you could write some similar words for y. That's the output. And the traditional letter is y, but it could be f, like we saw in the last example, uh, and usually we associate that with a vertical coordinate, dependent, these are all the words that go with the words on the left, and, uh, and those would be the value, instead of all output values, we would call the range. So visually, is that easy to see here? Is for every x value, is there only one outputted y value? For each x value, is there one, only one outputted y value? As you go along, you can just kind of check for each one. Um, and in the case, if this is really true, if we have horizontal and vertical and this looks the way it does, then we can use this kind of test. But I don't want you to lose sight of the definition of a function. For every input, there is only one output. But you can use something called the vertical line test. So maybe you've heard of that. If we sweep a vertical line, pretend these are perfectly vertical, through the graph and you were to keep doing that, is there ever a time when you would draw a vertical line and it would hit the graph more than once? The answer here is no. And so this is a function in the most proper sense. So we're going to say yes to this one. And uh, maybe you already have the answer to the next one, too. We're supposed to say yes or no. What are we supposed to say? Function. That is a function. And what about this one? Looks good so far if you were to sweep a vertical line through it. But I think you can already see, maybe before ever even doing all that, that when you get to this area in here, we have some issues. There's a spot here, for instance that it hits the graph at two places, and everywhere in here it's hitting the graph at three places. That's a problem, because what that communicates to me is that there's an input value, looks like, uh, you know, like for instance, x equals zero, that produces for us three outputted values. If we were back on the freezer problem, that would be like saying at uh, three hours into the process, we have like three temperatures on the, on the thermometer. In the real world, it just doesn't make sense to us. Functions don't represent everything in the real world, but they do represent a lot of a lot a lot of really important concepts in the real world. So this one is not a function. It's not. It's not because it's not interesting. It's still a very interesting relationship. But we it's still just, like it. Just we fine. still like it. It's just not a function. Sorry. All right, Miss Engelman, hit us with C and D. Okay. So C and D, um, we're doing the same thing, but we just have different representation because now we have ordered pairs. So what we want to look at is we want to check and make sure 
Uh, if an x value is repeated, does it go to a different y value? And in this particular case, we have two here and here, and what do you know? The y values are different. So that's a problem because when we have a function, we want to know that when we put an input in, we're going to get one and only one output. So this one is not a function. If all of your x's are different, then you have no problem. Notice here, x is 4, it's 6, it's 11, it's 10, it's automatically a function. Very nice. And if you can tell, what are these test writers, or summer packet writers, if you will, um, or but what are we trying to get you to realize? We're asking you the same question, just in three different formats. So it really goes to the fact, do you understand the definition of a function? Because I'm throwing it at you in a couple of different ways. So I'm just gonna redraw up here one of Mr. Chase's graphs that kind of sort of looked like this, I think, right? And he was showing you that this is not a function because before an x of zero, what happens? At zero, there are a y, there's a y value here, a y value here, and a y value here. But that goes to show exactly what Ms. Engelman's situation was, right? Because let's say, for instance, this point is zero comma negative four, this point is zero comma negative one, and this point is zero comma three. Notice that when you have the repeated x and you get different y values for that same x, you graphically line up vertically, and that's why the vertical line test works. But what Ms. Engelman is saying, I don't have a graph, so I'm just going to look at where do I have repeated x values. If I were to graph that, it would be at 2, 7, and, whoops, <laughs> and at 2, 12. I scaled a little off. But notice, same x, different y's, graphically lines up vertically, so therefore fails the vertical line test, which goes back again to the very definition of a function. The same input cannot give me a different output if I want to be a function. If I want to, so we not, not like non-functions, we just are not gonna name it a function. So down here in E and F are just two, or just another way to represent the same situation. Here's independent, here's dependent. And in math class, just like if you're an athlete, this is a scrimmage, right? It's, you know, in a scrimmage you don't have the same, you don't have real game situations. If you're a musician, you don't play your scales when you sit down at a recital, but you practice your scales. In scrimmage, you practice the drills. In math class, when we're practicing without units, without real world, we just default to X and Y. I don't know what X is, don't know what units are, don't know what Y is, don't know what its units are, don't know what situation this is. This is just practice. So I'm making sure that I understand that if I have a domain independent x input of four and it takes me to a two, but I have, that's good to be a function. But if I have a five and it takes me to both a four and an eight, that ordered pair would look, those ordered pairs would look like this. So I would have this Engelman situation, two domains, different outputs, not a function. I would have Mr. Chase's graph. At five, I would plot the four, and I would also, at five, have to plot an eight. Fails vertically, fails ordered pair, fails in, I don't know what this is called, image, pre-image, something like that, mapping um, situation. I can see the same representation of one output giving, me, one input, excuse me, giving me two different outputs. I don't hate this graph, I don't not, or mapping, I don't not like it, I can still graph it, I can list ordered pairs, I just cannot call it a function. As opposed to over here, and what I like of what they did here in writing this problem is showing that, trying to make sure to unscramble some confusion, if you like, to say, well, four takes me to five, feel pretty good about that. Eight takes me to seven, feel pretty good about that. One takes me to nine, feel pretty good about that. Whoa, two also takes me to nine. Am I okay with that? Because over here, I saw one arrow, you know, one value, and two arrows coming from it. Here, I also have something that has two arrows, but it's coming to it. So is it okay if I had one comma nine in Ms. Engelman's representation and two comma nine? Can I still have a function if I have 
to different domains that yield the same range. And I hope you understand and have seen in Algebra 1 that that's still okay to be a function. If you wanted to think about Mr. Chase's graphing, what would that do? That would be 1, 9 and 2, 9. Well, those things line up horizontally. That's okay to be a function. So yes, this one, f function, b e not function. See, it's a little sad. And that, and that produces, that's a good real world meaning too. If you go back to the freezer, is the temperature allowed to be negative two at two different times? Ah, good. Or actually three different times, yes. I think it was on the original graph, right, wasn't it? Right, let's go um, back, let's see. And the to the beautiful like, graph that I have yeah, here. Yeah, three different times the temperature was right? negative two. Like, is bam, that okay? is that okay? bam, is bam, this, is this all negative two. Yeah, this is still a function. Yes. Know that happens. Yeah. Um, Can you see another time on there where I have or another degrees that has multiple time with it? Wow. Maybe I should erase this, huh, Mr. James? <gasps> no. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another degrees where I have multiple times? Bam, bam, right there. Still a function. Right? But as, but there is no time that has two different degree values. All right, well, if you stick with us and we, you hang with us for the other four problem sets, you guys are going to be experts and really, really well prepared for Algebra 2 this yes. coming year. So this is Thanks. the end of the first one. Thank Thanks you. for listening. From Mr. Chase, <laughs> Ms. Engelman, and Ms. Guess. And to you, of course, for watching. Yes. <laughs> we love you all. Yes. <laughs> Have fun this summer. Nah.